Hey there, Victory family. I'm Jason. And I'm Pastor Don. And this is the Victory Podcast. Family, welcome back and thank you so much for joining us this week. It is such a blessing to have you with us. This week, um, we're going to kind of take it in a little bit of a different direction than we have been. Um, And we're going to talk about... Bible contradictions. Are they real? A a lot of people like to use them, use them against the Christian, to Mm -hmm. to be honest with you. To be Um, sure. I've always said one thing. If you have malice in your heart, you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. You can handpick a verse and you can take it out of context and you can make that verse say absolutely anything you want it to. But I think there's some very important things to remember as a Christian, and there's some very important tools that that God has given us in our biblical toolbox to help us understand what these so-called contradictions are. So, Pastor Don, are there really any contradictions in the Bible? No, absolutely not. Now, having said that, there are variations, right? but there are no contradictions. You're right, Jason. What happens, you've got people who've already made up their minds. Well, if I've already made up my mind, it shouldn't come as any shock to anybody when I find what I was looking for. Right. I've said my entire ministry, anybody who will come to the Bible with an open mind, that is not having already prejudiced themselves against it, anybody who comes to the Bible with an open mind will end up getting saved, being a Christian, and believing the Bible. That's why I like the Methodist slogan, open hearts, open mind, open doors. I got no problem with any of that, absolutely, because most people come already have made up their mind. Yeah. Go big shock. It's like, I'm already, I'm not going to like dinner. Mm-hmm. Whatever my wife cooked, I'm not going to like it. That's hard to do. Shock. Makes, makes good food. Yeah, I know. But <laughs> shockingly enough, I find that, guess what? I don't like it. Why? Because I already made up my mind. Yeah. <laughs> the same thing is true with the Bible. It's now, hard to like something that you've already decided you don't like. Exactly right. You see that with your sons. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they've already made, I don't like this stuff. How many times have you heard Colton say, oh, I, I don't like that? You've yeah. never tried it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Now, having said that, Jason, while the Bible is easy to understand on many levels, Well, even Peter says in 2 Peter 3.16, talking about the writings of the Apostle Paul, he says, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things. Now, notice he said some things. Underline that part in your Bible. Hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. See, Bible contradictions are the result of people who Peter would say, well, your problem is you don't know the Bible. You're unlearned. Where the, He's not saying they're stupid. Right. He's not saying they're uneducated. He's saying when it comes to the Bible, that's their situation. And they're unstable. They have no foundation on which they're building their lives. Well, and there's a reason why we call young Christians baby Christian, or no matter how old you are True. in in, well, in in your life, when you come to the cross, when you come to Jesus mm-hmm. Christ, you are a baby in Christ. And there's a reason you're, you're unlearned, you're uneducated. Exactly. And, and that's what we're here for. Yeah, many of these people have never one time picked up a Bible, or at least they've never actually read it through. They're simply restating something they read somewhere that somebody said that they probably didn't read either. They got it from a professor in a college class or somewhere like that or from a book they picked up that, again, kind of went with what they already hoped they would find anyway. Unfortunately, Shock. in today's society, it's, it's so much easier to just regurgitate information. It is trendy. You know what I mean? Rather than actually do any work or Mm -hmm. research for yourself for that matter. There's a reason why the Bible says study to show yourself approved. Um, If it most people don't want to do that. No. They're lazy mentally. Yeah. And to be honest with you it it takes work to study the Bible. Sure. It does. But that work pays off in the end. It means when you do the work you end up being sure of where you stand. That's why most Christians 
the Bible calls them unstable. It says, you know, Peter says that they're like a wave of the sea. Right. Excuse me, James, that they're like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Well, that's because they don't have that found. They're not grounded on anything. So whatever comes along next, they're going to be blown one way or the other by it, see? But the simple answer to your question is, Jason, no one has ever one time found a so-called contradiction that actually affects anything, any major doctrine. There are numerical questions people have. Right. I can point to them. I, I can show you a list on the Internet of 101 Bible contradictions, and every one of them is just silliness. Yeah. They just are. They have nothing to do with Christ, the cross, heaven, hell, anything of any, and all of them are answerable, to be honest about it. Well, and I think I think a lot of times, we, we talked about this a little bit before, a lot of times when people use contradictions, they're either they'll they'll pick and choose sure they you will. know and then and they'll go oh well these things battle each other absolutely without having any context actually for instance there for a long time now bible scholars figured this out a long time ago but people still bring it up sometimes john says that concerning christ as he's going to calvary he carried his own cross but mark says they compelled one simon a Cyrenian. Mm-hmm. To carry his cross. Ooh, contradiction! No, he just dropped. He couldn't carry it the <laughs> exactly. whole way. It was heavy. They again read the rest of the Bible because Jesus one hasn't slept all night. He has been back and forth between Herod and Pilate all night long, right. walking the whole way. Oh yeah, along the way they plucked the beard out of his face and took a Roman cat of nine tails. And by the time he got that far, his back was literally laying in strips of meat, probably down to the bone. Mm-hmm. He was tired. He carried, And by Roman law, he had to carry his own cross. He carried that cross as far as he possibly could and fell beneath the weight of the cross. And from there, the Roman soldiers compelled Simon to carry his cross. Yeah. So there's no contradiction. There's simply, it, it's, it, we see it from two different points of view. It's like the camera angles on a sporting event. Right. There's a reason why they have multiple cameras for instant replay on any sporting event because one camera sees from a different angle. And sometimes you need that. Well, the Bible gives us every possible angle. There in the Old Testament, there's a fellow named Jephthah who is a judge in the book of Judges. And he does a dumb thing. Eh, not that we ever do dumb things, right? <laughs> no, of course not. Never, I've ne- never, never, never. Okay, Jephthah does a dumb thing. He's concerned about a battle. He's, he's got to go lead Israel in. And he makes God a promise that basically goes like this. Hey, God, if you'll give me the victory in this battle, then the very first thing that, come, that I see when I get home, I will offer to you as a sacrifice. Yeah. Okay, shock of all shocks. The first thing that comes out of his door is his daughter when he goes home with the victory. Right. Dumb statement. Bible scholars say, well, see, he offered a human sacrifice, and that's... No. Number one, it never says he actually offered her. We assume he did, and it may be a good assumption. But the other assumption is God never told him to do that. That was his own silliness. Right. There's no reason to expect God to, God. well, God will not contradict his own word. See? So things like that, but again, they're all answerable, Jason. So... There's a lot of critics of the Bible. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, you could throw a rock and some of and, pretending and to be some yeah. of them pretending to be religious. Yeah, yeah. Some of them. Oh, you know, I believe, but mm-hmm. you know, the, well, if you believe, if you take the the Bible at its at its face value, if you take it for it being the truth, then then there is no but. Absolutely. That being said, why are why are non-believers? Why are critics? Why are they so afraid of the Bible? <laughs> like why? Do they try to use the Bible against itself? Well, number one, Jason, they hate Jesus Christ, and they hate Christianity. Number two, most of them, and again, I'm not. I'm making a blanket statement. I know there are exceptions, mm-hmm. but most of them have never actually read the Bible for themselves. They're simply parroting something they heard, whether or read in a lecture or in a book somewhere. I think your first point there, mm-hmm. they hate Jesus Christ. Oh, that, absolutely. I mean, that's that's really powerful. But I think if you break it down on a personal level, I think what they they really hate is they hate their how they're living. <laughs> they, absolutely. They don't so much hate Jesus Christ. They they hate the way Jesus Christ makes them feel about themselves. Well, of course. Because 
they're not living according to his way. And, and when, when you hate Jesus, you have to turn that on yourself and really examine that and go, well, why do I hate this person if I don't believe in him? Exactly. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it's not that you hate him. It's ha you hate the way he makes you feel. Right. He puts you under well, conviction. We can, use, yeah, we can use the same example. Um, you go to church. Yeah. You hear a sermon on the word, from the Word of God. Yeah, we had one recently that kind of yeah. kicked me right in the face. And you get get all convicted about it. Like, like, preach, any preacher who never gets convicted by his own sermons <laughs> probably shouldn't be preaching. <laughs> but that's a side point. That's a point for another podcast. <laughs> um, the point being here, you get all convicted. Right? I used to, and it used to bug me. Right. People come to church and they visit, and they don't come back. And I used to take it personally. Well, they must not like me. They yeah. must like my preaching. No. Finally figured it out over the course of time, over the course of the years. The problem was they got all under conviction. And when you get under conviction, you're only going to do one of two things. You're either going to get right, that is, you're going to do whatever it is the Holy Spirit is convicting you about, or you're going to get gone. Mm -hmm. Well, when we talk about these critics, it's not near, it's really not nearly so much about any real desire to get the truth out no they hate jesus christ they feel bad because you're right they they get all under conviction think about it there are consequences aren't there mm -hmm. when you if you believe the bible to be true you're stuck with the fact that the bible says i'm a sinner yeah and the bible says that sin condemns me to eternity without god in hell and That's, even when you're saved you're still a sinner oh absolutely you're a sinner with a, you're a sinner with two natures in fact mm -hmm. Um, I've jokingly said we're spiritual schizophrenics. <laughs> That's overstating the case, but it bounced back and forth. Yeah, yeah, we're we're stuck between the two. Yeah. Um, if you believe the Bible, you're inevitably going to come to the part where I'm not good enough by my own efforts. Never can be, never will be, to ever merit God's acceptance. Therefore, my only hope, and here's where the problem comes in with the critic, my only hope is to say, Jesus, I am a sinner. You're the Savior. I need you. I cannot do this on my own. Mm -hmm. There's the problem, you see. I think a big thing to use against critics, and, and before we move on and, and move a little faster here, mm -hmm. is there's one thing that, that your daughter Amanda used to tell me when Marlon and I first got together. I, 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 was, I was baptized, I was saved, but I... You know, I'd never taken any any of it seriously or anything like, you're like that. You're like a whole lot of other Christians, sure. I mean, you know, believers, I should at, say. At the time, I, I did it on a whim. Mm -hmm. But there was one thing, and she said it, and it, it kind of stuck with me. And, and Amanda, this is the part where you hit the thumbs up button because I'm saying that you're right. Um, is that that if I'm wrong and there is no heaven, there is no hell, I've lived a good life. Mm -hmm. I've been good to people. I've met great people in my life. And and you know what? I have have benefited from from having a good life like that. But if if the critic, if the non believer is wrong, there's an eternity of consequences That's to suffer right. with that. You better believe it. So, that being said, mm -hmm. why do so many Christians act like the non believers, the, the critics are right? Honestly, because they're they're They've not been taught the scriptures. We are living in an age, Jason, of unparalleled Bible illiteracy. I think it's the the squeakiest wheel gets the grease. There's a well, lot. There's a lot of non-believers out there, and well, they've got a loud yes. voice. They've got an entire Hollywood. They've got media. They've yep. got they've Absolutely. got a large presence. Yep. And we've got within Christ, the the boundaries of Christianity a whole movement that is more concerned about seeker sensitivity, mm -hmm. making church as unchurchy as possible so that people who don't go to church and don't like God in the first place Will come to church. feel comfortable in church. Yep. And the Bible by its very nature, Jason, is confrontational. If you're not convicted in church, you're in the wrong church. You're in the wrong place, that is for sure. So that's one. They've never been taught the scriptures. They listen to teachers who themselves, and I'm talking about professing Christians standing in pulpits, who don't believe the Bible is inerrant, infallible, and inspired like we've talked about before, like we recently talked about in a whole lot of Wednesday night services that I would highly recommend you to watch just for this reason. And they've learned to believe the devil's lie. Yeah. And it gives them what's called, technically speaking, a confirmation bias. Um, that is to say, confirmation bias means, and by the way, some, even some of the most brilliant minds in the world fall victim to this. Basically, it means I'm so 
focused on proving a point that I can't see anything else around me. Yeah. Uh, they don't understand a contradiction is by definition an outright denial. It means to deny something directly it means to deny it categorically. Right. There's a difference between a contradiction and a variation. And there are variations within the Bible, but there are no contradictions. Let's let's take a look at some of those those contradictions. We'll back mm -hmm. up in our notes here. For for all of those of you sure. that don't realize, we have we have notes because otherwise we'd never get through this thing. Yeah, it, we'd be here forever. Uh, we both of us get off on tangents that are <laughs> a mile and a half long. This is so, so true. So let, let's take a. You said you wanted to do two. Let's let's take mm -hmm. a look at those two and and mm -hmm. kind of examine them and and let's let's see how to combat those. Mm -hmm. Well. The easy part is how to combat them. But in a nutshell, like we talked about, you've got Jephthah mm -hmm. who offers his daughter as a burnt offering because he made a he made what I would refer to because I, I just call things like I see them a <laughs> stupid pro, a stupid promise to God. Right. Something God would have never asked him for. I mean, yeah, okay. You've got Isaac who one day hears God say, <laughs> Isaac, I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac. I want you to offer him up yonder on Mount Moriah as a burnt offering for me. Well, the thing of it is, God never had any intention of letting Isaac do that. That becomes clear if you read the rest of the story. Jephthah, on the other hand, just makes a stupid promise to God that I don't believe God had any intention of asking him to honor. And when he gets home from the victory that God did, in fact, give him, he feels obligated because his daughter, and he whines about it and complains about it, and the Bible says his daughter goes two months and wails her virginity, um, she believes she's going to become a burnt offering, but the Bible never says he actually did it, number one. We assume that. Right. Number two, God didn't tell him to do that in the first place. Sometimes it, the fact people make this mistake, Jason. God, well, I don't want to put this politely because it could get really kind of mean-spirited here. <laughs> um, God is smart enough to know when to ignore our stupidity. Just because God doesn't stop something doesn't mean God approved of it. Right. I mean, people say, well, if God, want, if God wants me not to do this, he can stop me. Well, no, you've got a free will. You can do anything you want to do, but you're not free from the consequences of that. Absolutely. So... I think the some of the biggest things we're going to have to mm -hmm. take away from this is going to be one context in the Bible is extremely oh. important. No, not extremely important. It's everything. It's everything. That's right. I said earlier, mm -hmm. you can make the Bible say anything you want it to say. Mm -hmm. You can make the Bible say, you know, how many how many verses in there, you know, talk about drinking wine and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Oh, see they drank in the Bible. Yep. Well, all right, yeah. But let's look at the context surrounding that, okay? Let's look at the context surrounding anything that you might face out there as a Christian. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? There's any number of things. We have a young man in our church, you know, and I was talking to him about this before I we really kind of decided to do this podcast. And the question was, is, is do a lot of your friends, younger people in particular, do they use little bits of, of what we like to call regurgitated information to to combat when you start speaking about Jesus? Mm -hmm. And the answer was yes. And again, that's what you said before we started. How many people have actually read the Bible for themselves? Right. Exactly. How many people have actually picked up a Bible and gone, oh, you know what? I heard this scripture and I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Well, have you read the whole chapter? Well, have you read that whole book? Do you like being told you're wrong? I respect people when they tell me I'm wrong. I don't like it at all. Okay, same thing's true. When the Bible tells me I'm wrong, I generally don't like that. That doesn't mean it's not good for me. Right. There are a couple of illustrations that apply because we're going to talk about context. There's the story about the old boy who did what a lot of people do, Jason, picked up his Bible, and he, you know, they just flip open and go like this. And, well, that must be where God wants me to read today. <laughs> and he read that verse in the Gospels that says, And Judas went out and hanged himself. <laughs> and he said, That can't be right. So he flips it again. And he goes like this. And he goes like this. And he reads the verse that says, Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> Oops. That's not how you read the Bible. No. 
Um, if you're going to read the Bible correctly, you're going to read it systematically. And context is just that. Context means God didn't just grab a verse. I, explained, I mentioned this to you before we started the podcast this morning. There's a verse, I think it's in 2 Timothy. I should have written down the reference, but I did not. You can Google it. Um, that says, moreover, she shall be saved in childbearing. Now, if you read the context, it's that's talking not. about Mary giving yeah. birth to Jesus. Literally, she gave birth to her Lord and Savior. Savior. Yeah, it does, kind it of doesn't a, mean you have to give birth yes, to be saved. But there are whole there are whole branches of so-called Christianity that have been based on this idea. And one of their core doctrines is that a woman cannot be saved until she has children. Well, that's not what it says. Well, there's there's verses about being baptized. That if you're not baptized, you're not saved. Exactly. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Again, context is what we use to explain that. I think the important thing to remember, too, is a lot of people do uh, like these verses of the day. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Yeah, that's great. You read that verse of the day, but if you don't take and and go back and read that chapter and understand how that the context of that particular verse fits into the the narrative and the and the story mm -hmm. of that chapter. Sure. Okay, you've memorized a verse or you've yep. learned that verse that day, but you right. have no idea what yeah. context it comes It's easy, in. for instance, to go back into the Old Testament and read a verse without thinking first, well, wait a minute, who did God actually make that promise to? Is it a promise that's meant for me to, for general? Or was this something God specifically said in a certain situation only to the nation of Israel. If that's the case, that promise may not be for me at all. Context is what we use to determine which one is true. And there, there's two types of context, right? There, yep. There's immediate context, what comes before and what comes after. Exactly. That verse, right? And then there's there's scriptural context, yep. you know, the Bible as right. a whole. The verse I mentioned a minute, the two verses we just mentioned a minute ago. One that says, she shall be saved in childbearing. Another seems to imply that baptism is essential to salvation. Right. Well, if you stand alone, those have those verses stand alone, you'll get confused. But if you go to the rest of the Bible where it says, for instance, not by works of righteousness, which we had. Well, baptism is a work of righteousness. It's something I do because I've been saved. It's not by testimony. works of right exactly not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy hath he saved us the by the rest of the bible um ephesians 2 8 and 9 verses most christians have memorized or at least can come close for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves mm -hmm. if the re the whole of scripture interprets each individual verses because the scriptures do not disagree with themselves if i come across a verse i think well that doesn't no my understanding's wrong and i need to study it out figure out where i'm wrong because the Bible is not wrong. So I think, a, a, you know, an important thing to remember is no matter where you go to church or what church you mm -hmm. go to, if you feel like something is a, quote, contradiction, mm -hmm. go figure it out for yourself. Exactly. Read it for yourself. Exactly. Read that chapter. Read that book. You know, if it exactly. came from John, read the book of John. Mm -hmm. You know, but keep things in context. Keep things exactly. in perspective of that book. The other thing to remember is is the Bible is really old. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? 6,000 years. Or when was the Bible written? Hmm. Over, over several yes. decades, obviously. The Bible but. was finished in 95 A.D. when John wrote the book of Revelation. And over a period of some 1,400 years previous to that, the Bible is written 1,400 years, 66, uh, 40 different authors, mm -hmm. 66 individual books. Right. So that's a lot to absorb. Now, we're going to run out of time for this one, so let me real quickly, you mentioned it a minute ago, go over, here's some, here's some principles that you can use that will steer you. And when you're done, if you practice these faithfully, you will never majorly misinterpret the Bible. Right. One is like we said, we've been saying, Jason, let the scriptures interpret the scriptures. That's context. Immediate context, biblical context, or scriptural context. The second principle is this. The meaning of a word, phrase, or sentence, or paragraph is derived from the context. In other words, I don't get to redefine words based on what we see today. I need to understand what did the author try, what was he trying to say then? And that was the point we're making. Yep. Yes, it was written a long time ago, and you have to kind of take, that's a part of taking that context, is is that was a different 
world mm -hmm. doesn't mean it doesn't apply today. Right. It just means keep it in the context but, of yes. the time. I need to understand the applicate the interpretation, what it meant to the author at the time, before I can make an application. Then I can interpret the scriptures. Right. But I got to realize the goal. And this again, people get messed up, Jason. This is where you've seen the books on Bible codes. Well, I have a problem with that because my job as a student of the scriptures is to understand the scriptures, not to find hidden secret truths or something no one else has ever found. If God wanted to say it, it would be well, yeah. spelled out exactly in how he wanted to say it. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon says there is no new thing under the sun. If I find a brand new interpretation that no one else has ever found in the Bible, there's about 100% likelihood what I'm about to speak is either blasphemy or heresy, mm -hmm. one of the two. And you are wrong. Big time wrong, yes. <laughs> the other one is, this, and this is critical. This is where people get in trouble more often than any other place. Interpret the scriptures literally unless you have good reason to believe it's not literal. It's figurative. For instance, we've talked about this a lot. When John <laughs> baptizes Jesus, it mm -hmm. says, he saw, I saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. It doesn't mean it was a literal bird. Without, with all due apologies to the old country song, On the Wings of a Snow White Dove, it was not a literal dove. John was describing an event he saw in terms other people could understand. That's figurative language. Right. But the Bible, God's smart enough. I've always wondered, why would God put a bunch of things in the Bible that we can't possibly understand? Right. No, he wrote the Bible so that you and I could understand it. And the last one is this. We don't get to interpret the Bible in the light of our personal experience. You talked about this a minute ago. Yeah. This is why the antiquity of the Bible is so important. We interpret, put this way, I don't interpret Scripture in the light of my experience. I interpret my experience in the light of the Scripture. Right. It's the old adage, don't get the cart out in front of the horse. No, the Bible is right. If my experience disagrees with the Bible, my experience is wrong. And if you understand that principle, you have any idea how many things people do today that they want to blame God for? that they would stop immediately because, no, the Bible's right. My experience must agree with the Bible. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, family, remember, we have we have a, a almost a book here that we've been mm -hmm. reading off of. There is tons and, and tons of And that's the condensed version. The first set of notes I put out was 45 pages long. Well, and you That had, would have taken a while. You had a, what, a 100-page document on Bible contradictions? Something like so -called that. So-called yeah. Bible somewhere in that, yeah. Somewhere in that ballpark. If you want more information on this, please reach out to Pastor Don. His his email address is there at the bottom of the screen, Pastor Don at victoryindy.org. Mm -hmm. And and if you ever come up, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, X, Y, and Z, and you don't know practically where to go in the Bible to help combat that, you know who's a great resource for that? Your local pastor. Exactly. He is a wonderful resource for that. If you don't have a local pastor, Pastor Don is always here to answer questions for you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, here's what you do. Before you decide, number one, pray about it. Right. Most people get in trouble because they don't pray first. Compare Scripture to Scripture. Research it. Jason's right. There's so many resources out there. Make sure they're reliable, though. Yeah. Just because they claim to be a church doesn't make them reliable. Then write it down somewhere. And when you're studying the Bible, keep a notebook. Yeah. And take that notebook with you, and people do it here all the time. And I've so, I tell people, the greatest honor, in my opinion, you can give your pastor. Say, Pastor, I was reading my Bible this week. I came across this. I think I understand it, but I'm not sure. Is this what this means? So write it down, talk to your pastor or your spiritual leader. That might be a Sunday school teacher or a mentor, whatever the case may be. But that's that's how you do it. Yeah. Pastor Don, any final thoughts before we quit? Um, other than the part where we say, pick up a Bible. And read it. Read it. Just read it. And you know, start in the Gospel. If you've never read the Bible before, start in the Gospel of John. I want you to see Jesus for who he is and what he did. And then we'd then go on from there. But that'll give you a good foundation to work from. Read your Bible. Let God speak to your heart. The Bible, rightly understood, will always, always, it's good for us. It's good for our, it's good for our being sure, and God wants us to be sure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. Lord, we could be twisting in the wind quite literally 
if it were not for the fact that over 1,400 years, you spoke to no more than 40 authors, and you gave us a library of everything we need to know to live life well and acceptably in your sight. Lord, I'm praying for that person right now who has never one time really be developed, began to study the Bible. That this will be the moment where they decide, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to be content with just what I heard and what I might remember. I'm going to study the Bible for myself. Lord, I know they're going to be glad when they do. And we're grateful for grace and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Victory family, you are such a blessing to us. Hopefully we are a blessing to you. Remember, this ministry is proudly supported by the loving and gracious people of Victory Baptist Church right here in Indianapolis, Indiana. To find out where exactly we're located, there is a map on our website at victoryindy.org. To support this mission, you can also click the online giving tab. Remember, if you live anywhere close to the Indianapolis area, we would love to see you on Sunday. Find out all of our contact information on victoryindy.org. Remember to like and share this with your friends. And until the next time, have a safe and blessed day.